And CNN's colleagues in Jerusalem are standing by to keep us up to date from that angle. CNN's Linda Scherzer is here. Linda, what's the latest there? Well, it's been a very good morning for Israel. Those were the words of Defense Minister Moshe Aarons, who appeared on Israeli television just about 40 minutes ago. It's now a little after 8 o'clock in Israel. The Israelis are waking up. They are now glued to their TV sets and radios and learning about an operation with a great sense of relief, an operation that happened while most people were fast asleep. The streets were virtually empty in the uh, early hours of the morning in Israel as Operation Desert Storm got underway. Shortly after the news was reported here, the army ordered all Israelis to stay inside their homes, to open up their boxes containing their gas masks, and to be prepared to use them. Sometime after the air attack started, a senior off army officer reported that some of the bases and missile launch sites that posed the greatest threat to Israel had been dealt a serious blow by Allied bombers. The news brought a great sense of relief to the Israelis who had been preparing for the possibility of a chemical attack to follow the breakout of war. But defense officials and other Israeli leaders are saying that the danger has not completely passed and that, and that Israel still has to be ready. No, we have uh, uh, long experience in this and we know that this is, uh, we listened to the American statements that this could be a long uh, engagement. Uh, we have made the preparations in the, for the, our population. We've uh, asked them to take certain precautions, ask the people to stay in their homes uh, for the moment. Uh, so we have not relaxed our state of alert, but we follow things, as I said, very closely and wish the American and other forces uh, uh, full success. Again, as the defense officials are saying, the danger here has not completely passed, but things are looking a lot better in Israel than they did even 12 hours ago. This is Linda Scherzer reporting live from Jerusalem. And Linda, before you go, how long will the alert continue in Israel? It appears that there is a lull right now, but will the alert in, in Israel continue? Well, the Army tells us that this is on uh, indefinitely. We can't say for sure when it will uh, end. Israelis uh, are being told, as I said, to stay inside their homes, to be close to their gas masks. Uh, we have seen a number of people who are out on the streets. Uh, the Army clearly doesn't want that to happen, and uh, the uh, advisory is still on. People should stay inside uh, until the danger has completely passed. Thank you. CNN's Linda Scherzer keeping us up to date from Jerusalem. And this just in, the Soviets say that President Mikhail Gorbachev will address the nation on Soviet television within the hour. We will attempt to bring that to you live as it happens. Patrick. Right now, from, for the very latest developments in eastern Saudi Arabia, let's check in with CNN's Charles Jaco, who is on the phone with us right now with the very latest. Charles? Well, Patrick, there have been some preliminary, and I have to stress these are preliminary indications that air operations might possibly be continuing. This is based on three things. One, uh, we've received a uh, report from one of the journalist pools out in the field that reports about an hour and a half to two hours ago they saw a flight of nine U.S. F-15s, three Kuwaiti Hawk model jets, and four British Tornado jets take off. Now, about the same time we were outside, we saw one squadron of F-15s, their afterburners glowing, arcing up into the cloudy sky and heading north toward the Kuwaiti border. We're not sure, of course, if all this means much of anything. These could be essentially reconnaissance in force flights. However, there is a handout from the British uh, Armed Forces Information Desk here, which talks about the initial phase of the operation, which began this morning. And they stress initial, and uh, they end the uh, communique by saying operations continue. So there is some thought here that perhaps, and I have to stress perhaps, based on this evidence, there might be a second wave uh, at least preparing to be in progress. Again, there's no confirmation of that, but there has been a fairly heavy amount of air traffic in this area. Uh, one other thing we have to stress from here, there have been some reports, we understand it, uh, of uh, some sort of Iraqi Scud missiles that were launched in the direction of Saudi Arabia. We have checked with both uh, U.S. and Saudi uh, defense sources here, and they categorically deny it. They say it's untrue. They say, as far as they know, during this entire operation, they have detected no sort of Iraqi counterstrike, either in the form of guided missiles or in the form, indeed, of airstrikes headed towards Saudi Arabia, that the skies have been completely clear. Uh, the one thing that the defense people here also want to stress is that ground forces has not even begun to be used yet, that there may be reason for optimism, but there is certainly no reason that 
this point to declare any sort of victory because you have around half a million Iraqi forces still dug in in Kuwait. And even if the reports are true that the, uh, that the Iraqi Air Force and most of their elite Republican guards have been destroyed, uh, there is still the matter of all those troops in Kuwait that would have to be dislodged if they don't surrender, and they would have to be dislodged by a ground assault. But people here are watching and waiting to see what might happen next. Charles Jaco, CNN, reporting live from Saudi Arabia. Uh, Charles, from your vantage point where you are in eastern Saudi Arabia, and we talked with our colleague John Sweeney a little while ago from Riyadh as we looked at some U.S. pool video of the F-15 Eagles uh, taking off and preparing for the attacks earlier. From your vantage point, how many uh, jets did you see taking off I mean, that actually took place in the attack uh, into uh, Iraq and into a Kuwait earlier? Well, the F-15s apparently, from everything we've been able to ascertain, played a, a major role in the attack as did other sorts of, uh, of fighters and fighter-bomber attack aircraft. Uh, apparently the only major uh, plane in the U.S. arsenal that did not play a role in this attack was the large lumbering B-52 bombers. We've been told that there are 20 of the B-52s, uh, those by aviation terms, ancient bombers, uh, in the Middle East in this area someplace, a uh, location undisclosed. But since they fly high and relatively slowly, the, the supposition among people who've been watching it is that they would not be used until the skies could pretty well be swept clean, if you will, of the Iraqi Air Force and Iraqi air defenses. Okay, Charles Jaco reporting live from eastern Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much, and he will keep us updated on any developments from that point. Susan? In Amman, Jordan, CNN's Tony Clark is standing by. Tony, as dawn breaks, as the morning uh, gets underway in Jordan, what is the latest there? Thanks, Susan. Uh, perhaps uh, some of the most interested in what's going on both in, in Iraq and in uh, Kuwait are the Kuwaitis that are here. There have, Jordan has been a, a site for many of the Kuwaitis who have fled their country in the wake of Iraq's uh, invasion to, to come and, and wait for something to happen. Khalid Alanzi is, is a Kuwaiti who's here. He has been listening to the radio throughout the day. When you first heard that there were bombs flying, uh, falling on Baghdad, how did you feel? What did you do? Well, I was surprised also as everybody because we are not looking for war. Nobody wants war. But Mr. Saddam Hussein, Mr. President Saddam Hussein, he looking for these things because he don't obey all the international opinion. He don't follow the laws of the people. He don't want peace. He's not looking for peace. That's why they started the war against him. Well, one of the things you were telling me earlier, your reaction when you, when you first heard that the, uh, the bombs were falling, what did you do? Well, I was crying and happy at the same time. I can't express my feeling to you because I was crying for my family in Kuwait, for the Iraqi people also in Iraq, and I was happy because I want to see my country free. When do you plan, when do you hope to be able to go back to Kuwait? Well, today, as soon as possible. I backed my thing now. So that you think this may be over quickly, you can go back to Kuwait yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. see your family. Yeah. And what do you expect to see when you get back to Kuwait? Well, just I want to see Kuwait. Just Kuwait, I want to see the sand of Kuwait, that's more than enough. You left November 1st, you have been in uh, Jordan though, only, only 10 days. How was Kuwait when you left? Well, it was a ghost city. It's nothing in Kuwait, they sell on everything. There's nothing in Kuwait. And what do you want to happen to Saddam Hussein? Is there anger? Is there, there fear? Is there, is there sadness? Saddam Hussein, somebody will punish him, his country, or his people. We, are, we have no right to punish him. Let his people punish him. Thank you very much. One of the things that, that we have heard from Kuwaitis here in Jordan throughout the morning is uh, they say we are wrong when we say that the war began today. They say for them, the war, the Persian Gulf War, began on August 2nd when Iraq came into Kuwait. I'm Tony Clark, CNN, reporting live from Amman. Thank you, Tony. And to recap, uh, British Prime Minister John Major is expected to hold a news conference within the hour. Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev is also expected to address the Soviet people on Soviet television also within the hour. We hope to bring both of those events to you live. Patrick.